Hello everyone and welcome back to Amos, our course on Agile Methods and Open Source. After laying the foundations of uh, the theory behind um, Agile software development, in the following three lectures I will now go over uh, the three main work streams associated with the three committed roles of Scrum and also be a bit more general. So first it will be Agile planning as associated with the product owner role. Then it will be Agile programming as associated with the software developer role. And then it will be Agile coaching, the Scrum Master role. As a final reminder, please, please make sure that you properly sign off your commits if you don't do that. And in particular, if you don't declare your co-authors, we will not be able to see which work you did and hence you will not get any grade for it or, or a rather poor grade. Also, again, during sprint review, don't talk about it. Show your work, show your work, point to it and explain it. Do not just tell. And also, don't forget the sprint preparation meeting. So, the product owner. This will be an extensive session. I'm squeezing it as usual into one hour, but there's a lot of uh, surface area to cover. Your project, that's a project, has a product goal. That's the term Scrum uses. Uh, the product goal is the purpose of undertaking the project. Now, you may remember how I was a little bit picky on the difference between project and product. So what we're doing in Amos is to distinguish between a product vision and a project mission. Scrum only knows the product goal, which is why you're doing what you're doing, which may or may not apply both to products or projects. The Scrum guide is rather vague in this and many other respects. So here in Amos, we split this into two separate things, the product vision and the project mission. The product vision, which is a vision, is the timeless reason of why the software that you're developing should be there in the first place. So like a product, there's no set end date. A vision really is not, does not come with an end date. It's a vision of a somewhat grandiose sounding, but a vision of a better world, and if only in small increments. So in the context of software development and economic activity, it's the business value of why someone is paying for the development. What is it really that they want to get out of it? As an example, the wild side or the flowers example application that we're using. Here you can see the product vision for flowers. It's a social network to help enthusiasts of flowers connect by way of photos they upload and others who rank their photos and discuss it and so forth. Separate from the timeless product vision is the project mission. What you specifically, the Amos Scrum team, what you want to achieve within the three months, within the semester lecture time that's available to you, what you want to achieve within that time frame. So that is time bound. That is not a grandiose vision of a better world. This is specifically what do you want to achieve. You can't nail it down. This is agile, but you do have a mission that you can formulate. And so, for example, going back to our flowers, it could be um, the mission of this Amos project is to create a minimum viable product for uh, the flowers extension of the wild side framework. And you list maybe some core functionalities. It's tangible. The project mission has an end date and you think about and formulate what you want to have achieved by that end date. Like the product, a pro product vision, it's rather short. Uh, the product vision and the project mission are a paragraph each. Together they constitute the product goal that Scrum asks us to have. And so this is a one-time deliverable. Now think about what your product vision and your project mission is 
and put it into the planning documents as described in the homework document. Now the product goal is lofty. Oh, it's a paragraph. Uh, on the other hand, you're working on detailed requirements. The product owners are trying to be clear and crisp about all the features that are needed. And the software developers want good detailed descriptions possibly uh, so that they can turn it into running software. So there's a big gap between a one paragraph product goal and the details of a large product backlog, that first column of the feature board that you're doing your planning and organizing with. There's a large gap and that needs bridging. We will talk about the product backlog in a bit, but first I want to talk about that bridge, which is the product glossary. As you do your, as you talk to your industry partner, as you derive requirements, as you put them as entries into the product backlog, you are learning, you are starting to use the language of the business that you're developing software for, also known as the application domain. And the application domain comes with weird vocabulary that you may not be familiar with. If you were developed to develop software for a financial services company like a bank or an insurance company, you would have to learn that terminology. Maybe you have an intuition what an interest rate is, but unless you've worked in that domain, you probably don't know what the underlying is. That's highly specific language that you need to pick up. And in order to make sure you can use it effectively in the product backlog, you need to have, uh, need to provide and develop and maintain a product glossary. So product glossary is simply a list of application domain terms. And um, it's a poor man's approach to a traditional analysis model. Um, in Agile, we don't want detailed, complex models that keep changing, at least usually we don't want it. And also um, analysis models described using a formal language like well, somewhat formal language like UML or another formal language is often not so feasible or so, uh, so much doable by product owners and certainly not understandable by customers usually. So that instead of a traditional formal language for describing analysis models of the application domain, we use the much more lightweight version of a product glossary which concerns, con contains the key terminology of the domain and gives it crisp definitions. These terms are the concepts from the domain. Interest rate, underlying financial instrument, uh, savings account, savings book, etc., etc. These are all terms from the financial firm that a bank, a banker might use. Um, and you need to capture those terms for your domain and put them into the domain glossary so that everyone in the team has that reference point in the glossary where they can look up a definition of any of the application domain terms to better understand what it is uh, they are doing. So for um, Wildside and for the flowers application, photos and flowers are key domain terms. And here you can see an example domain glossary for um, um, which gives you definitions for key terminology from the domain, what's a photo and what's a photo rating, etc. You can see that a glossary really, really a glossary really is a large table or a list of entries with the term being defined and its definition. And that definition should be crisp, not long and windy. It should be usually one sentence. That makes it uh, clear what it is. How to do it wrong? Well, it's a simple intelligence test, arguably. If you can't nail it down quite, then you will start waffling um, and you will not be precise. Um, if you can't get, you can't wrap your head about the application domain, you may start using concepts from the technical domain, but that doesn't belong into the domain glossary. 
etc. You may have redundant definitions, all kinds of things to that go wrong. And let me skip those because obviously you should do it right, which means that perhaps you should try to work from first principles. So when I write a domain glossary, I'm already trying to understand the concepts and some type hierarchy. What's the super type or the more common concept and what are specific specializations or variants of it. And that's the backbone structure of a glossary because it gives you usually the core nouns and it relates them using inheritance, meaning is a, um, uh, an interest rate is a um, percentage value uh, used to calculate what a uh, customer gets in terms of interest from their savings account or so. So you should have, if you can, um, a structural model in your mind and express that using pros, maintaining the relationships that you would usually have in a formal model, but you put it in pros so that your customers can also understand it. Don't repeat yourself too much, avoid redundancy and make it composable and make things build on each other. Also watch out that you don't do a lot of overlapping terms. The best glossaries clearly have the terms be mutually exclusive, meaning they don't overlap, yet be completely exhaustive, meaning they cover the whole domain. There are no gapping holes. It's a challenge. It's actually uh, in some sense harder than using a formal modeling language because uh, there is no compiler like for a formal language that tells you you're making syntactic or other mistakes. So um, you don't get screamed at by the machine that you're making mistakes, which makes it harder to get it right. And you need to be much more focused. But as a benefit, you get it uh, you get a glossary that your customer can understand and that they can talk to you about and tell you that this term definition doesn't, uh, 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 isn't complete, doesn't include, um, say, with interest rate calculation, what to do about the days of a period that ends, is it included, is it not included, and so forth. So from now on, please start delivering a product glossary, meaning you define, provide definitions of the key terms in your domain, and you need to keep that up to date. Now that we have a product goal, and uh, now that we also have a language in form of the terms of the application domain, we can talk about the requirements for the software, which is what we put into the product backlog. Scrum has a lot of backlogs. A backlog in general is really just a to-do list, uh, ideally nicely done, meaning it's prioritized, that what is at the top is most important. And also each item in the backlog is crisply defined and uh, well written so that it's easy to understand. Of this general concept of backlog, there are three main ver versions or subtypes in, in uh, Scrum. There's the product backlog, which are the um, items, features, mostly requirements that the product owner thinks need doing uh, by the team. And the product backlog contains all the items known to the product owner at the time. It's separate from the sprint backlog, which is that small subset of the product backlog that for a given sprint, the software development team agreed upon and committed itself to, uh, to do that, to do these items during the upcoming sprint. So it's a small part of the product backlog. The sprint backlog is usually finite. It needs to fit into one sprint while the product backlog is always growing, at least uh, for product development and uh, but even for project, for projects where not necessarily everything that's in the product backlog will actually be get done during the project. Separate free, separately from the software development itself, there's the impediments backlog, 
which we call the imp squared uh, backlog here because we want to be explicit that it's not just about impediments, meaning problems with the process, but also initiatives, opportunities to improve the process beyond just fixing problems. So Scrum talks about an impediments backlog, we call about impediments and improvements backlog in Amos. So these backlogs have items, consequently the product backlog has product backlog items and so forth. These backlog items in the case of the product backlog and necessarily then the sprint backlog are usually or ideally features, functionality requirements for the software to be developed. As previously explained, I also accept for Amos that you put your bug report so that you put bug reports for bugs there that needs fixing. You shouldn't put the actual bug report there, but you should put uh, an item there that references a bug reports and declares that in urgent need of fixing. And then also refactorings, cleaning up code to improve the code quality of the software. These are three main types of work that you do in an Amos project as a software developer. And there are three variants of a backlog item here and you can put them into your product backlog. Of the feature, meaning the domain functionality that the industry partner, the customers want, uh, you can distinguish them into the coarse grain large scale epic, which covers a subset of the domain but is too broad, too big to get done within a sprint, and the constituent user stories, smaller features that fall into an epic that are actually sufficiently small enough so that they can get done. An epic is a large feature, arguably, and user stories describe small features that can be achieved within a sprint. So I've talked about features. So I guess it's implicitly clear, it was clear that these are requirements. The definition by the IEEE is it's a distinguishing characteristic of a software. So it's well, some property. And so a feature or a desired property of the software characteristic here needs specification and needs doing. A refactoring is a behavior preserving code transformation to improve code quality. I'll return to that in the next session. The key here is a refactoring doesn't change the behavior, it's behavior preserving. So it doesn't change the behavior of the software, it just improves the code quality. It cleans up the mess that you sometimes make that everyone sometimes makes. And a bug fix is of course a fix or a resolution uh, um, of a bug uh, reported in the bug tracker or in under issue management and you want that fixed so that the underlying feature starts working again. As explained, an epic is a large feature and it should never be at the top of the product backlog because it's too big to get done so it should be further down and breaking up into different smaller features, which then are precise enough that they can get top prioritized and get done in a sprint. So arguably the Epic is the placeholder for a large set, or well, sometimes not so large, but for a set of much smaller features that taken together constitute the Epic. And these smaller features are basically represented in their backlog entries, but they're presented by user stories, a specific way, a sentence template for describing the desired feature. These user stories, you're doing it already, but here again is the definition. A user story is a way of describing a feature using a sentence template. And that sentence, sentence template goes like this as a person in a user role, I need some functionality so that I get specific business value. Three components. Who am I? What do I need? And why do I want it or need it? User stories written this way are not complete specifications. They are obviously full of holes. But that's deliberate. The idea is that they start a discussion during sprint planning and maybe serve as a discussion starter later on as well, 
they started a discussion during sprint planning where the developers try to understand what's in the head of the product owner by asking questions based on seeing a sentence template for a user story here. The assumption is that the product owner wouldn't be able to write down every little detail and that it's also not clear which details are even relevant for a software developer to know or to be communicated to a software developer because maybe they already know it. If the developers are asked to ask questions, they will ask about what they don't know and won't be told things that they already know. So here's an example, the tell a friend feature from the flowers application. As a flowers user, so in that user role, I need a function to tell a friend about a flower photo. So here's the functionality. I can tell a friend about a flower photo implied here sending email from the application so that I can share my passion for flowers and increase my network. Here's the business value, the user gets a little piece of happiness sharing their passion, but also ties in or increases their network on flowers. All right. A common alternative that you will find in industry is a different sentence template. Uh, more commonly, it looks like this. The system must be able to do this or that. And quite frankly, it's very similar to user stories. It's more elaborate. So there are, of course, methods that elaborate on the more common uh, template, sentence template structure like this. And uh, not surprisingly, you can have whole databases of recurring requirements formulated this way. In the end, it doesn't matter as long as the focus, which way you describe things, as long as the focus and the embedding into the process is that it helps effectively to transfer the knowledge the product owners gain from discussing requirements with the customer into the software developer's head along the lines of what the software developer needs to understand about the desired feature in order to implement it. There's a traditional set of quality criteria for backlog items called the invest criteria. A good backlog item uh, that's ready for uh, doing is uh, independent. So when it's it's time, it has no further items that depends on. They all have already been done if there are any. It's negotiable, meaning it is uh, open for discussion. Uh, it's valuable, there's clear business value. It's estimatable. It can be understood to such an extent that uh, and it's so precise or well described that it's clear what the size and size of that, the complexity of that feature would be. As that size is being discussed, it's at least small enough to fit into one iteration, so one sprint in Scrum. And of course, it should be sufficiently concrete to be testable. These things uh, relate to each other. You can't estimate something that isn't also somehow uh, testable and obviously it should be valuable. That's already in the user story. In addition to the user story, you should add to the feature description of a, uh, that is a product backlog item, you should add acceptance criteria which are a list of acceptance criterions, <laughs> criteria. Uh, so one acceptance criterion is um, a proposition that must be true for the item before it's accepted as it has been completed, it has been done. Uh, so if the tell a friend feature implies that there's a function to send an email through the website, then an acceptance criterion is an email is being sent when the user clicks on OK or Send. And these acceptance criteria are basically tests specific to this feature written by the product owner to indicate to the developers, this is what I'm looking for. Yeah? This is what I want to see in order to say, yep, the feature has been finished. The size of a backlog entry that is being estimated for doing in a given sprint so that it can become a sprint backlog item 
The size is captured in story points, as you know. So that's a measure of size or complexity, not of effort or duration, because we want it to be people independent. So you look at the inherent complexity of the implied programming work that follows from the feature. Yes, again, as explained at the start of the course, uh, the values are kind of arbitrary. The key is that as you start estimating features, you return to same size features with the same story points. So it doesn't matter whether a certain size is always a 5 or always an 8, as long as it's always a 5 or 8 and you're consistent with your estimations over time. So again, you are asked to estimate the size or complexity, uh, which does not depend on people, but, and not the effort, which would be a measure of duration, and that would de be dependent on people. You're trying to be people independent. As you prioritize backlog items now, there are a couple of different approaches. Um, there's an obvious one. You can't do something that has dependencies or that has dependence. Um, so other stuff that needs to be done beforehand. So you sort things by dependency. What is it? independent comes first. And then um, you also always focus on the value. What's most valuable should come first. And here is an interesting observation. Most will get it wrong, but as you look at your features and see, I'm simplifying here with a binary distinction, high value, low value. But as you look at your features and recognize something is of high value, people will often be tempted to do first what can be done easily and do second what is hard or risky to do. And that's exactly wrong. As you sort your items in the product backlog, you should always put the high value items to the top if they can be done and the dependencies have been done already, what they depend on has been done already. But then you should pull forward and do earlier what is risky and what you feel certain and is easy to do should come after that. And the reason is, of course, because it's valuable, it needs doing. You cannot do without it. So avoiding facing a risky or hard to do item is problematic because as you might fail at doing it, but you are not allowed to fail, arguably, um, you learn about that way too late. So you pull it forward and address it head on so that you can react to a potential failure. That's why you have to do first the high value, high risk items. Then you should do second, the high value, low risk items. And after that, you turn only after that, you turn to the low value items and do the now easy to do ones. While the low value items that are risky, you probably never do them. Yep. So high value or low value inverts whether you should focus on high risk or low risk items first. As you do your planning, you may have noticed that what's in the product backlog on your feature board and then in a sprint backlog and so forth. These are the items written by the product owner and product owner are necessarily highly technical people. And in any case, what they write should be business value oriented. So it's the language of the business that's being used to describe the uh, feature. Ideally, all the terms can be found in the product glossary. For a developer to actually do it, if the product backlog items are small enough, there's a simple direct correspondence between the backlog item and what the developer does. But sometimes you have to break down a more complex backlog item into tasks. And so these would be engineering oriented formulations, things you write down as you take one, two, three steps to implement the feature or the backlog item. 
So the task is what a software developer adds to a backlog item to detail it from an engineering perspective. They're implementation oriented. Realistically, in Amos, where we try to make sure you have only small backlog items, I generally hope that there's no need to have this additional layer of tasks and product backlog items are small enough and that they can be done right away. But if you as a developer feel it needs breaking down into tasks, by all means go to it. All right, let's, let's turn to the process of planning. Now that we have the basic tools, the uh, product goal, the product bag and the product glossary, the product backlog and its content in place. We perform the work, as you know, in defined time boxes or iteration. Uh, in Scrum, they are called sprints. And uh, one sprint and all the sprints should have the same duration, even if sometimes during a given semester because of some holiday or so, one sprint is longer than the others, can always happen, or there's the holidays, which makes it a very long sprint, etc. So um, sprints are same duration iterations or time boxes. And they should have, according to the Scrum Guide, they should provide an increment of value. So they are focused on improving the business value of the software being developed. In terms of duration, um, it's usually one to four weeks. And in Amos, because it fits how projects work at a university, we do one week uh, sprints. In industry, probably two week sprints are more common. You can also do four week um, uh, sprints, though after that uh, it's getting too lengthy. And if you do six month sprints, then you're not really agile. The sprints I just talked about are the regular sprints. Well, planning, execution, review, release, retrospective within a time box of always the same duration. In real life, of course, things get in the way. So there are the holidays. Well, the holidays should be vacation. Uh, they still make the overall real-time duration longer and kind of screw with the, uh, the total available work time anyway. But imagine a holiday that falls onto the team meeting day. Then uh, you have uh, suddenly a sprint uh, because the other days of the week you should be working, you suddenly have a sprint of two week duration rather than one week in Amos. But there are other reasons why you would have a duration that's different from the usual one. For example, if uh, there's a particular external event like, uh, like a fair, like a CES or CBIT or something or Hanover, Hanover Expo, uh, then you uh, may have to adjust your timing and you do a longer or shorter sprint with the goal of perhaps delivering the software at a particular specific point in time and post to you on the outside. Also, in terms of time variation, there's uh, uh, different purposes that sprints have. Again, most sprints should be the regular sprints with a sprint goal and so forth. I'm coming to that in a second, but sometimes you do exploratory sprints where you uh, prepare to maybe throw the code away because um, you're just testing something. Or sometimes you do a cleanup sprint focused on really just cleaning up uh, exist a poor code base. Arguably, you can say that's the sprint goal then, the purpose is just a regular sprint but um, it needs to be clear in your mind what the goal of that sprint is. Anyway, so for sprint planning, in the run-up to a sprint uh, planning meeting, the product owner proposes a sprint goal, what the sprint is about, and prepares the product backlog to match that sprint goal. And then during sprint planning, the Scrum team agrees on the sprint goal, and performs the sprint planning as I've previously explained it. 
So new here is only that there's an additional, that there's a sprint goal and otherwise the preparation, the grooming and the refining of the product backlog and the run up to the sprint planning uh, is still the same as before. The idea of a sprint goal is that there is some overarching purpose of a particular sprint. So it's not just everything in the kitchen sink, um, but it is something more cohesive. It used to be called theme, for example, in the, uh, in the past. I'm not sure it got renamed in the last Scrum Guide to a sprint goal. So the goal of the sprint is to focus on some particular area. So all the top prioritized entries in the product backlog should somehow feed into that sprint goal. The sprint goal is prepared and proposed by the product owner and it's usually business related, although maybe it could also be sometimes technology oriented. The developers should agree to it and then commit to it. And realistically, your, the developers are unlikely to disagree with the product owner. So if the product owner actually expects some disagreement, it should perhaps be discussed before the meeting because you don't want a meeting where you don't agree on what you're going to do in the next sprint because then you won't finish sprint planning. Anyway, during sprint planning, the first thing to, dis to discuss is the sprint goal. The assumption usually is, again, team accepts what the product owner wants unless they have good reason to disagree and they ask questions. So they discuss it and ask what it's mean, what it means and why it's valuable and so forth. And please uh, start working with sprint goals, meaning the product owner needs to write down a sprint goal and uh, propose it at the planning meeting and the developers need to discuss it, understand it and under usual circumstances agree to it. Now planning in, uh, in Scrum relies on in Scrum as it has been adopted, adapted to the software world by um, well-known consultants. Planning in Scrum works with the concept of velocity, uh, simplifying development speed. So velocity is the, or the speed is the number of story points. So the total size uh, that you can achieve over time. So you probably know this from high school physics. Uh, speed is uh, distance over time. Over distance here is the number of story points you can do in a given time frame, typically one sprint. So if you're doing 25 story points per sprint all the time, that's your speed. You can chart it. It's likely to vary a little bit. In one sprint, you get here in the illustrating example. In the first sprint, you got 23 story points done, then 21, 22, 23, 27, back to 21, etc., etc. Yeah, so um, this, fairly, this is fairly regular. This suggests a team that's been working uh, together for a while already. Uh, your, your sprint your story points per sprint may be fluctuating more widely than that. Once you have that per couple of sprints, like by the mid-project release, you can determine average uh, speed uh, by simply averaging through the um, time series of um, story points you did in the last five or so sprints. So you can get an average uh, value for your uh, speed and start planning with that. The planning you do is, of course, um, each sprint. It gives you an idea of whether what you currently are, have put into the sprint backlog may or may not be too much. Yeah? So you can count the story points in there and see whether it's roughly the same as in the past. It's OK if it's a, a bit higher. It's OK if it's a bit lower, uh, as long as the next additional item makes it just too big. But story points really shine for the next larger scope, not just the sprint release, but the project release, of which again we have 
2 in the Amos project, the mid project release and the final project release. So as you try to lift your planning time horizon from the individual sprint, which could be as short as one week, like in the Amos project, to a longer time horizon, and you have to do that because your customers most certainly want to know. As you do that, you need to structure your process. And as previously explained, the common way of doing it is having higher level releases, not just sprint releases, but say project releases if you're doing a project or product releases if you're doing a product. And they don't happen every week or every sprint. They happen in longer time intervals. So the iteration for project releases is longer. It's seven weeks in uh, Amos. And after seven weeks, the mid project release is due. And after 14 weeks, the final project release is due, plus or minus a sprint, depending on which semester we are in. And that's how it's in industry too. Yep. You may have quarterly releases, you may have annual releases. As long as you're doing sprints within that larger time frame, you're still agile. So software development can be viewed as this sequence of project or product releases. And then there's this refinement or hierarchy of higher level and lower level releases. And for that, you can plan. And such a release plan in Scrum as, as some well known as it's commonly done. This is not in the Scrum Guide, but as it's commonly done past that, as established by leading tools in this space and some books um, which you can find in the literature uh, to this course uh, looks like this. You create so-called release plans, which are more than just a pile of features in the sprint backlog column of your feature board. So what you do is you have a goal for a sprint but then you look beyond just one sprint, you look towards a project release as a sequence of sprints. So if you were to do at the beginning, the full blown planning of a project release, you would look ahead for in Amos seven weeks. Now for the mid project release, uh, you're only starting this one week before the mid project release. So there's not much left, but you will have to do the full planning of the final project release for the second half of the project. And here we expect that you look ahead as hard as you may feel it is, product owners, I'm talking to the product owners, as hard as you may feel it is, we want you to plan for seven sprints you know, for what fits into that project release. So how does it look like? Well, you look at the total number of sprints you have to plan for. You give them a goal and you put in the you know, key features that you expect fall under that goal. And you estimate either yourself or with the help of a developer, you do a rough estimate of the complexity or size of these features and keep adding things up. You can see it here. Um, I'm only showing three or seven sprints, but um, let's assume the first sprint uh, called deliver with a goal of deliver first increment of software has only four features, register, login, logout, and reset password. And you estimate 8535 in terms of story points, then that's it. And you're doing it with a team where you think you can do 21 or maybe more, a bit less of story points each uh, sprint. So you're estimating things based on, and you're putting as many features into a sprint based on your past experience of this development speed of the team. And so you plan, you, you uh, sketch out the first sprint, then you do it for the second and third sprint. You're not even doing it yet. It's for the next project release, but you're planning. You know, it's planning work. You're not doing it yet. So you can have the estimated size. It's not the development team. It's just a developer helping the product owners here or the product owners doing it themselves. And you can see how it adds up uh, the whole uh, estimated size over all features is the total re estimated remaining 
um, uh, size or complexity of the work that needs doing. And so it adds up to 63 here in the example at the beginning of sprint one. Then if sprint one works out and you actually get the 21 story points done, at the beginning of the second sprint, the estimated remaining story points were reduced to 42 and then to 21 and so forth. And actually in my example here, I really only have three sprints, so it's not seven. But that is the plan. Now, it turns out as you do things, the real size may be different. So in my example here, the real size after the, fir of the first sprint was captured correctly, but then after the second sprint, the team tells the product owner it's, uh, it was 23. So um, it is, uh, they got more done perhaps, but now the remaining effort is lower and uh, they can only, well, perhaps do 19. Let me explain that uh, using the so-called burn down chart, which makes it a bit, uh, bit more easily graspable. You're planning and you're doing a project, re you're planning for a project release and you sum up all the story points of all the features over all the sprints and it's 161 before you start the release. That's the plan. And you plan that after one sprint, um, 23 story points were done and you're down to 138. After yet another sprint, you're down to 115 and so forth until in sprint after sprint seven, you're down to zero remaining story point, which means all the work got done. As you'll notice, this is a plan here and somehow um, I'm making the simplifying assumption that every sprint you take off 23 story points in the form of features that were done from the product backlog. Now then, you actually start doing it. The key here is you had a plan and the purpose of the plan was that at the beginning of the plan, you could tell your customers, given what I know or what we know about our development speed, after or for this upcoming project release in seven weeks, we will um, be able to deliver these 161 story points, which corresponds to these particular features. And then you start work. And of course, it never works like uh, planned. So you realize that uh, maybe after the first sprint, uh, you were at 145 uh, rather than uh, 138. So you didn't get as much work done. Maybe you'll catch up, but you realize yet another sprint later, you're at 126 rather than 115. So the gap is narrowing along and it wasn't just a fluctuation, but the gap keeps widening. You keep going and it still keeps widening because now you're at 103 and you didn't catch up to 92. So apparently there's systemically a difference in the actual speed versus the assumed speed. The actual speed that you're estimating from the running average over your last sprints uh, turns out to be 19 story points rather than 23. So if you are now taking that to project into the future, you will see that by uh, the end of sprint seven, you will be missing uh, a certain amount of story points, uh, presumably 25 story points or so. And Obviously, you don't want that or being agile means reacting to the changes in environment in a smart way. You're not ignoring that things are not working out, but rather you are accepting the reality and adjusting your plans accordingly. And that means simply lowering your expectations because that is the realistic thing to do. Whatever it was, that made you believe it's 23 story points per sprint, doesn't matter if it's 19 story points. Maybe technical debt caught up with you. Maybe it's something else, it doesn't matter. The key is you have to work with 19 story points. So what you do is 
you change your plan of for the remaining functionality taking the real functionality as the baseline and you plan and readjust the plan the release plan as well as its visualization by way of the spawn down chart to the newest development speed and as you do that as you can see how much work you can get done you may actually shuffle the different features around as to based on the priorities you know if in the previous version you could get some fancy features in but um, and the new version there's no room for it then maybe you should drop it should drop them so you adjust to things you work with a lower speed and you have to do this every sprint in a company ideally you have a good tool that does all the charting for you in amos sadly we only have the planning documents i just don't want yet another tool so you have to do it by hand but it's really not that hard and the product owners can do it i want you or it's part of your deliverables i want the product owners well the team but it's likely to fall on the floor. product owners to create a mid project release plan now you're very close to the mid project release but after that a final release plan and keep that release plan updated yeah so every week the product owner based on what they just learned about what's possible adjust the release plan the final release plan so that we can see what the team still believe what the product owner based on current speed still believes is possible within the remaining time frame of the project when we talk about quality criteria for features then um, we also talked about the acceptance criteria which are simple tests for has this feature been done in terms of what the product owner expected the acceptance criteria are specific to the feature and hence they vary from feature to feature now i want to talk about something called the definition of done how to test that you are done with a feature a definition of done is an auditable checklist of propositions about an artifact but unlike acceptance criteria it's shared by all the artifacts of the same type meaning if it's a product backlog item then the definition of done for product backlog item is the same for all product backlog items unlike acceptance criteria which are specific to each item hence it's not related to the functionality itself to the business the application domain it's usually of an engineering nature are there enough tests is the quality high enough etc and it serves to test whether the work has been done from an engineering perspective this concept of a definition of done according to the scrum guide is to be applied on the level of the individual feature the product backlog item but also on the level of a whole sprint release because the sprint release is more than just the sum of the features and a project release because it's also more than just the sum of the sprint releases how so well there's additional quality criteria you know the sprint release is more than just the features because you want uh, them to work together and not block each other the project release really shouldn't come crashing down like a sprint release still might so there's additional uh, quality criteria arguably from smaller to larger the requirements in the def form of the definition of done of when something is considered having been done uh, get more stringent things get more get tougher and more complicated no not necessarily more compli complicated but the requirements grow you know? so um, here's an example for definition of done for features for for one feature there are component tests and they pass i'm not telling you how many i'm not giving you a percentage code coverage but it could be added code review has been completed and code has been merged so if you're doing peer review 
uh, and someone else needs to review and accept the code, the merge request, the pull request on GitHub, then that is part of it. All feature branches for that feature have been merged and closed and it has been documented. These are requirements, part of a definition of done for features. You can actually use that for your project and of course you can have your own. For a sprint release, um, it's different, it's a release, it's not a feature. So certainly you want the project to properly build, deploy and test, meaning all the existing tests run through, everything's green. If there's a database, maybe uh, any update required to the database or the scripts succeed, consistency tests on it, uh, on, on it pass and so forth. Sprint release notes have been written, change log has been updated if you're keeping one, etc. It's up to you, no? but this is an example of a sprint release, a definition of done, a DOD for a sprint release. And here's a final one for a whole project release. Maybe in addition to component tests, also called unit tests, maybe in addition to those, you have user interaction tests yeah, that go through the user interface. And maybe those have to pass on all browsers for you to say, this project release is done and we can give it to a customer. You get may get more specific with test coverage and say it's gonna be at least 70%. So depends on how ambitious you want to be. The documentation should be there, the design documentation and user documentation. It is up to you. I ask you that you create and agree upon in the team on definitions of done for all three types, for features, sprint releases and project releases. But what you write in there is up to you. So you can be less ambitious and more ambitious. If anything, however, and you get more, feel more secure over time, please strengthen the definitions of done. Do not weaken them, but strengthen them possibly. If they stay the same, it's probably okay too. But again, if you want to be ambitious and do extra good work, then don't be too relaxed and do improve or strengthen the definitions over time. Past sprint planning and release planning. I want to shortly talk about road mapping. That's definitely not part of Scrum proper any longer, but it's naturally what happens in real product development and in real companies. So the roadmap is a timeline of your product then under development and it's different product releases, which often have their own uh, logical structure. You usually have an alpha release, a beta release, then general availability, meaning it's the 1.0 version that you make available to the public. And then if you use semantic versioning, you have increases along the major version numbers, signifying major architecture changes or something. And you describe that over time. The roadmap indeed is somewhat high level and the details will be found in the project releases because a project release here matches the alpha release and the beta release is another project or product release and the general availability releases the third project or product release here. So here, if it's a product, it's a product release. So you describe it on a high level and you typically have actually an internal and an external roadmap. The external one is what you communicate to the world, certainly if it's a product and the internal one is like the external one, but more detailed. So you keep details to yourself that you don't want the world to know. The roadmap is a middle of the road, <laughs> is a mid-level uh, planning tool. Above it is the product vision, um, which is basically not really limited in time, except that of course things always change. So there is perhaps a change coming. And then below the product roadmap, in terms of shorter time horizon, you have the project or product release. So you can see it here. Long is looking into the future as the product vision, followed by the product roadmap, followed by the individual product release, and you build the product roadmap from product releases. And that ranges from many years to a few years to months. 
what you work on uh, is also different. The vision is basically high level ideas. The roadmaps is major themes and epics and the product releases smaller epics and features. Inversely, so to that abstractness is the certainty. You know, the vision, you have rather low certainty of achieving it, medium for a roadmap and high for a product release. Most importantly, you have different people who are responsible for it and they need to work together. The product vision is owned by, and that's the business lingo, and the person responsible is the CEO or business owner typically. The product roadmap, in a case of a software vendor, a product company, that's usually the strategic product manager, and the product release is the scrum product owner where if it's not the same as the strategic project a product manager, then the uh, product owners typically will report to the strategic product manager. Often, uh, certainly if it's a startup, it's however uh, the same person. These three horizons, sprint planning, release planning, road mapping, and beyond that a vision, uh, they make sense. They are structured in an agile way, as I have discussed. As soon as you go beyond that one product into what a company does, for example, by way of a portfolio, a set of products that need coordination, then we are out of luck because there are no good agile tools for that. And suddenly we will be using what companies have always used, quarterly goals, annual goals, and so forth. This is not to say that there aren't frameworks like SAFE or Lean, which claim or tell you how to go beyond that one project or one product, but um, they are not quite convincing yet. Still companies use them, but in most cases, certainly in the case of SAFE, it feels like going back to uh, plan-driven software development, like quarterly and annual goals. So with that, we talked about sprint planning, most of which is on the plate of the product owner. And in the next session, we'll talk about agile programming, which will be mostly about what the software developers do. Until then, have fun and see you then. Bye.